Good morning. Good morning. Appreciate everyone being here today. Well, we've been talking about prayer, and uh, I don't know about about you, but it's uh, something we feel like we need a lot of lately, right? Prayer. As I've been studying uh, on this topic, I came across this story where this uh, statement comes from. Brother, the grass grows on your path. It's a story told about slaves, African slaves. And as, uh, as they were taught the Bible, as they accepted Jesus as their Lord, uh, they, they learned to pray. And the story goes that, that uh, sometimes, oftentimes, they, they had to hide those times when they prayed. And uh, so as they would go out in the fields to work for the day or around the homes where they stayed or uh, homes, <laughs> the story is that you would find these paths that would lead off into the thickets. And this is, is where they would go to pray, to hide. Uh, there was fear, of course, of being caught praying. And, uh, but, but they had learned how important prayer was. They had learned how important it was to the relationship with, with, with God. But sometimes those paths would, uh, the grass would start to grow on the path. And the others that you work with, members of your family, friends, your community, might say something to you like this right here, brother, the grass grows on your path. A suggestion that, that maybe you're not praying enough, that you're forgetting to pray. And so I wonder... How many of us, that statement might be true, the grass on our path grows, an indication that maybe we're not, we're not praying enough. So we've been uh, in, the, in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus taught his disciples to pray, taught us to pray, living the life of, of prayer is what we've been talking about. And we've talked a lot about the definition of prayer and the importance of prayer, and I wanted to share this passage again because I think it, 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 it says so much about the importance of prayer because it, it connects the peace of God, the peace of God to the act of praying. Not just prayer, but prayer is certainly part of it. Let's read that again. From, from, from Philippians 4, Beginning at verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness, your gentleness of life be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, that might be a thought to consider too. As I challenge us with this lesson, if we realize that, that maybe that peace of God that Paul talks to the Philippians about here is elusive in our own lives, maybe the answer to turning that around is to consider our prayer life, our prayer habits. And so I hope I can share something with all of us today uh, that we can glean about prayer, that we can understand about prayer to make prayer more effective in our lives, that we might experience the blessings associated with being a people of prayer, the peace of God. <clears throat> From Psalm 145, verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth, to those who come before his throne of grace, According to his will, he is near to those. And with that statement, and there are many places throughout the Old and the New Testament that give us that confidence. If he is near and ready, why do we call on God less often than we ought? I think that's one of the realizations that many of us have come to is that our prayer life isn't what it could be. And, and one of the reasons that it isn't is because of the infrequency of prayer in our lives. And knowing that God promises to be near to us when we call out to him in truth, when we call out to him, when we pray to him, when we lift our needs to him according to his will, the comfort that we can have is that he is near to us. Again, in, in life, if you're, if you're feeling those times or experiencing a, a distance from God, 
then maybe what we need to consider is that our prayer life isn't what it ought to be. So think about this. I was kind of making a list, kind of a personal list here. What are those things that hinder prayer in my own life? What are those things that keep me from praying with the frequency that God deserves me to pray with, if you will? Well, I think one of those things is it's a lack of faith in prayer. And really, a lack of faith in prayer is a lack of faith in God. I mean, do I really take him at his word? Really, God, are you there for me? You know, do I, do I read scriptures like we just did from Psalm 145 and, and believe it and take it to heart and put it into, put it into practice? Put it into practice. You know, it's amazing to me how often myself, I won't speak for you, but it's amazing to me how many times I, I pray to God and I just doubt. I just doubt that he hears my prayer, that he, that he cares that, let alone that he'll answer my prayer. And that's simply a lack of faith on my part. And I think one of the ways to, ch to, to get over that, to challenge this lack of faith, is to put into practice the song that Sam just uh, led us in. Count your many blessings. You see, when I take time to think about the wonderful, the marvelous things that God has done in my life, it's hard not to have faith in God. But sometimes we get stuck and focused on the negative things, don't we? And we forget to see the positive things. We forget to have that spirit of, of gratitude simply because we're not looking at the things that, that we should be grateful for. What a great piece of advice. Count your many blessings and see what God has done for you. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. This, is, this one speaks volumes to me. We make it too complicated. We make prayer too complicated. Sometimes we think it needs to be so formal and we, and, and, and we think it's, it's important about picking the right words. But in Matthew 6, we'll see in a moment when we look at that passage, it's not about the right words. It's not about, about the big words. It's just about the heart. We make it too complicated. Prayer truly can be uh, such a, a simple thing. And when we consider what we read throughout scriptures about praying without ceasing, the simpler we make it, the easier it is for prayer to be something frequent in our lives, to be meaningful in our lives, to be something that we don't forget about, but something we look forward to because of the relationship that we, that we have with God. And then, of course, there's the seed of doubt. Some of you might recognize this quote in here. <laughs> Did he really say that? Genesis chapter 3. As Eve contemplates what we like to refer to as the apple and admiring it, it was a delicious piece of fruit, whatever it was. Saw that would, I mean, you know how it is. You, you pick something out of your garden and it's ripe and it's ready to go and, and, and maybe you even salivate a little bit as you think about having that for for your lunch. David, I know you're salivating already thinking about your garden. And, and that's the picture I get of Eve, you know? And, uh, and Satan's encouraging her to go ahead. And she says, yeah, but God said not to. God said not to. And he just simply says, really? Did he really say that? You just Plant a little seed of doubt there. And that's exactly what happens to us. We get, we get caught up in those questions. Does God really hear prayer? Does he really care? And on and on we go. And we get focused on those questions as uh, rather than get, being focused on what God's word teaches about God and his love for us and counting our blessings. And so we doubt. And what happens when we doubt? We don't follow through. We don't follow through. Or in Eve's case, we do follow through in sin. Sometimes we feel like we don't know how. Sometimes we feel like we don't know how. 
And what a blessing then Matthew 6 becomes. As Jesus' disciples asked him, teach us how to pray. And Matthew 6 was a response to that. Sometimes it's a lack of, of practice. It's a lack of practice. You know, if you're like me right now and you're a Minnesota Vikings fan, we're pretty miserable people right now. And one of the excuses that the general manager is trying to make is that, well, we didn't have enough time to practice to get ready. Of course, I'm thinking, well, all those teams that are whooping up on us had the same amount of practice time. So, you know, but there's something to that in regards to our prayer life. Not, maybe not necessarily in the practice of developing the skill, but being in the practice of doing it on a regular basis. Maybe another way to describe it is to think of it as a habit. Is prayer a habit in your life? Because if it is, then when you miss it, you're going to, that habit, that practice will bring you back to making it up, if you will, to getting back into the, the, the actual act of praying when you miss it because it's, it's important to you. Those things that are important to us, we don't miss them very often, do we? We don't. But there is something to be said about practicing prayer. I mean, think about it. Uh, as a child growing up, how did you learn to pray, probably? You know, sitting uh, in a worship assembly like this and listening uh, to the men that led prayers for us, maybe around your table and listening to the prayers of, of your parents, of your siblings. You know, those times when we, we gather together and, and, and prayer is, is part of that practice. And I hope as God's children that, that that's connected to everything that we do. And so we hear prayer and we see prayer and, and we, we, we see the, the spirit, if you will, around the prayer, the way people behave around prayer. And those are the things that, that guide and direct us towards the practice of prayer in our own lives. I can remember as, as Keelan, my grandson, who is soon to be 14, as he was growing up, and there were those times then as we gathered around the dinner table and, and I would call on him to lead the prayer. You know, at first it was, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. But Grandpa wouldn't take no for an answer. We're kind of good at that. And uh, it's just been fun to hear him pray, to hear him grow in prayer, to hear how his relationship with, with God uh, is growing and developing. So who are those in your life that you can encourage to do the same? And I think the bottom line, it's, it's about our relationship with God. And when prayer isn't what it should be, then probably our relationship with God isn't what it should be. You know, a simple part of the definition of prayer is this idea of communicating with God and how important communication is to any of our relationships. And that's no less true in regards to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. We can say the hard things to those that care about us, and there is no one that cares more about us than God. So I referred to this a moment ago in Luke chapter 1. Luke records for us this question from the disciples. Now Jesus was praying, and again, here it is. is I, I don't want us to overlook how important this example of Christ was to his disciples and should be to us in our study and understanding of prayer as well. 25 times we have recorded for us the prayers of Jesus, and frequently those prayers are long. You know, times where he spent hours in prayer, long enough for his disciples to, to fall asleep in, in one recording for us. But as the disciples are, are noticing and recognizing and watching the example of, of Jesus in prayer in his life, they're touched. And so they ask the question as Luke records for us, teach us how to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray like, like John taught his disciples. And so here's the answer to that. If you'd like to open up your Bible and read along with me, 
I'll be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, I want to back up to verse 5. And Jesus answering that question, that request that's recorded for us in Luke, it's not recorded for us here in Matthew, but in Luke it is. Here's Jesus' response. But when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have receive their reward in full. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you even ask him. This is how you should pray. Our Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Pretty powerful passage there. Kind of sum it up here a little bit. Things that this that Matthew 6 teaches us that prayer should include. Expressions of faith and trust in God. Confession of our sins, praise of God's mighty deeds, thanksgiving for all the good things we have received, dedication to serve God and other people, and request for our needs and the needs of others. So let's look at these a little closer here. First of all, beginning with expressions of faith and trust in our God. It's not about the beauty of our words. It's not about our fancy uh, vocabulary. And that point is made by Jesus before he even gives us this model prayer, this Lord's Prayer, as we so often refer to it. He said, you know, don't be like, like those, those Pharisees who, who, who just love to stand up in front of everybody and pray because they just sound so holy and so amazing. And we know what some of those prayers are too, don't we? Oh God, I am so glad that I am not like these lowly sinners over here. You know, we've heard those. We've read that before. Or like the, the, the Greeks, if you will. You know, their, their language of philosophy, if you will. That, that wasn't any more impressive to God as the act of praying to be noticed by men. It's not about the beauty of our words. It's about words coming from here, our heart. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7, we have recorded for us the third of ten commandments. And that third commandment says is, is that we are to honor God's name. It is a holy name and it is not to be misused. And we need to understand that and practice that in prayer to honor God's name, to hold his name holy, to hold his name high in the act of prayer. And I think one of the keys to doing that is putting into practice what James 4 and verse 10 says for us. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you. Good piece of advice, if you will, to those uh, to those babbling Greeks and the Pharisees standing to be seen by men in, you know, when they prayed. Humble yourselves before God. And prayer is an amazing time to put James 4.10 into practice, to humble ourselves and to allow the power of God to exalt us. Because God has a purpose in exalting us. He absolutely does to bring him glory, to attract to others, to be obedient to the gospel. And that just happens so much more effectively when we honor God's name and we humble ourselves. 
along with this as well, expressions of faith and trust in God, how can we see the kingdom of God? Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I struggled with this for a while, and, and, and where I landed is here. It's about me. It begins with submitting to God's will in my life. In my life. The kingdom of God. Is there evidence in my life of the kingdom of God? And I think the first piece of evidence that needs to be there is my submission to God. My submission to his will. My exercising his will in my life. I need to see the kingdom of God functioning in my own life. And in doing so, uh, well, let me say this. Uh, God commands this, 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God, to obey his commands. That's what 1 John 5, 3 says. This is the love of God, to obey his commands. And I think that's a, a wonderful way to think about the kingdom of God being real in your life. It's evidence through your obedience, and it's an obedience that's driven by your relationship with God, specifically your love for God. How do you communicate love to God? Well, according to John, it's obedience to God's word. It's making the kingdom of God real in your life. And then when that happens, we can be the example of God's kingdom for others. What kind of example are you to the people in your world, your tribe, your family, your community? I think what I'm, a fear that I have in life is that maybe I'm not the best example that I could be. I would hate to be the reason that somebody else does something stupid. How about you? And I fear I've probably been that too many times in my life. And so I'll just I'll confess, this is often... Uh, something that I speak to God about in my prayer, that I will be the best example that I can be. And it begins with the kingdom of God being real in my own life. It's evidenced by my obedience, not to earn anything, but in response to the amazing gift that I've been given, the Son of God hanging on a cross to die for my sin. We must see God as one who meets our needs. Think about this. Real simple thought here. Have you ever asked for help? Well, of course you have. And I don't care what degree it is. Um, you're a third grader and you were struggling with your math assignment. You asked for help. The company that you work for went out of business because of a pandemic and you lost your job and you needed help, so you asked for help. You had a flat tire, you called up Dan <laughs> and asked for help. Okay, here's where I really want to go with this. So hopefully you've thought of a time in your life where you've asked for help. Who did you ask? Who did you ask? You asked somebody that you believed could help you, right? So maybe part of the problem with our prayer life is we don't believe that God can truly meet our need. It comes back to that lack of faith again. It comes back to that lack of faith again. I want you to understand something, and I'll make this point a little bit later on too. If you're struggling with that, then I just want to challenge you to try it. Act like you believe it. Act like, I mean, honestly, act like you believe it. Long enough for God to prove it. 
How many times do we pray to God with doubt when we should be praying to God and acting, even especially in those times we have doubt, and acting like he is a God that makes a difference? How are we supposed to get the world excited about a God we're not excited about? It's an honest struggle. And it's a, it's a fairly decent piece of advice. Act like it long enough to allow God to prove it. Then you won't have to act it anymore. We have to believe that we're important to God. And maybe that's, that's really the, the base point here in regards to trusting God, is believing that if you were the only one that ever breathed air on this earth and you needed a Savior to die for you, to pay the price of your sins, it still would have happened because you're that important. you got to believe that. Now, I, I hesitate to answer this question because maybe it's true for some of you. But has anybody else ever died for you? Now, there's a lot of ways maybe to answer that question. But has a God ever died for you? The answer to that question is yes. Jesus Christ hung on the cross for you because you are important. You are significant. You are loved. And if you don't believe that, you're believing a lie. You need to quit believing the lie and believe the truth. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, and you're the world. Confessions of sin is something else that we see in this example of how to pray as Jesus taught his disciples. We must see, our, and I think that begins first with seeing ourselves in need of a Savior. Because we're not perfect. We can't do it on our own. And unfortunately, out there in the religious world, there is a lot of teaching about if you're just good enough, you can earn your way to heaven. That is not biblical. What is biblical is that your salvation is a gift. A gift you have to receive, though. It won't be forced on you. Again, I think of 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God to obey his commands. Our obedience is not about earning anything. It's in response to the fact that the creator of this world thinks I'm something. But we need to see ourselves in need of a Savior. I can't do it on my own. That is, get to heaven. Can't. But I can receive the invitation from God through his son. With that, we must realize that the only thing that separates us from the Father's love is our sin. And he's got a solution to that. Again, his son on the cross. But we have to see the need for that. Otherwise, the cross has no meaning in our lives other than an interesting story recorded for us in the Bible. And those of faith know it's so much more than that. There are expectations, though, that come with our forgiveness. And that's recorded for us in Matthew 6 as well. And um, those of you who have endured my preaching for, you know, the last many years here at Cedar Lou have heard this story before. But this was Matthew chapter 6. It changed my life more than once. When I was uh, probably 22 years old, I got a call from my mother telling me that dad had left. And it wasn't long after that uh, my parents divorced. And I can remember... Uh, Kathy and I were at York at that time. We took off to, to go be with mom and comfort her and just deal with everything that we were dealing with as our family was falling apart. 
I hated my father. I hated him for what had happened to my family. I hated him for what he was doing to my mother. Even so much so, um, in 1984, uh, a couple years after that night when mom gave me a call about dad leaving, my brother was getting married. And uh, I can remember at the wedding, uh, the, after the ceremony, we were lined up outside the church on the sidewalk. You know, that greeting line. You know, the thing you have to endure before you can get some cake. And as we were lined up, um, my father is supposed to be next to me, but I wouldn't stand next to him. I mean, you would have thought we had COVID. There was so much social distancing, okay? Um, wouldn't talk to him. You know, I just, and that's, you know, there were years that went by. There was just no acknowledgement, no Father's Day cards, no holiday time. Remember what I said. I hated him. And then somewhere along the line, I'm studying Matthew 6. And I'm reminded that, hey, Mr. Smart Guy, hey, Mr. College Educated Guy, you don't forgive your father. I don't forgive you. I mean, isn't that what Matthew 6 says? Don't take my word for it. Read it again. Exactly what it says. I love God. I still love God. And because of that, I knew I had to obey. I knew there needed to be a change. I knew I needed to restore my relationship with my earthly father. But how? How? Well, here's what I did. I faked it. In other words, I started acting like I loved my father again. How did I do that? What was small at first? I started sending Father's Day cards again, birthday cards again. Called him. Say hi. Went to holidays with him again. Started talking to him again. Started acting like a loving son. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't feel it for a while. I didn't feel it for a while. So I faked it till I made it. And it worked. My dad and I, we have a great relationship compared to what it was. Oh, I don't get to see him as much as I'd like to and, and spend as much time with him as I'd like to. Uh, but when we're together, it's great. And it has been for years and years and years now. And how did it happen? I just started acting like God commanded me to act. And pretty soon the feelings caught up. And so maybe I, I, I share that story with you to say this, that as you listen to this study on prayer and you realize that maybe your prayer life isn't what it ought to be, I'm going to give you some advice. And if you need to just fake it for a while... I guarantee you, if there's anything in your heart, anything in your heart, any feeling towards God, those feelings will catch up. And that prayer life will become so much richer than it is right now. Praise God for his mighty deeds. The gospel, the gift of his son. And we accept that gift through baptism, through our sharing in that death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus experienced, we can experience that through baptism. And that's how we receive that gift. And what an amazing gift it is to be forgiven of everything that I've ever done wrong. And my list is pretty big. How about yours? I mean, those of you who know me even a little bit, no, how amazing God must be. And if Kathy was here, you know what she'd be saying. Yep, loud and clear. But not to make light of that at all. 
again. How many times just this morning have I mentioned this idea that God loved you so much that he allowed his son to die for you because it was part of his plan, part of his plan because he didn't want that sin thing to separate us and he knew we couldn't take care of it on our own. So he did, so he did. We need to be thankful for all the good things that we've received. Again, that song, count your many blessings and see what God hath done. Oh my, we are so blessed. But it's a mindset. It's a mindset. And we, it goes back to the passage we looked at earlier in Philippians 4, this, this mindset that we have. Are we going to focus on the negative or on the positive? That's a choice that you make. We all have garbage. We all have those stories of terrible things that have happened in our lives. Those times of grief. Those times of misery. I, Kathy and I, for the first time, we snuck away on Friday just to have a little time together and we went down to Cedar Rapids. Hadn't been down there since the the ratio. Am I pronouncing that right? The big blow, big storm. Oh my, I can't imagine what so many people are going through. The devastation on top in the midst and the, the pandemic. But what are you going to focus on? When tragedy comes to your life, what are you going to focus on? Focus on the tragedy. All right? Where's that get you? but focus on the amazing things, the blessings of God. That's ah, good for the heart. It's what gets us through the, the difficult times. We need to be, our prayers too, need to be about dedicating uh, ourselves to serving God and serving others. I, you know, I, I came across something that I'm really amazed about and, and studying more and more. I'm, and what I'm amazed about is how many religious groups out there are teaching that you can be like God, in fact, that you are God. Some will talk about it uh, in this way, that God is the big G and we are God the little G. Oh my, how scary that is. There's nothing biblical about that in any way, shape, or form. And then it dawned on me that that was exactly the temptation that was presented to Eve. Oh, God didn't really say not to eat that. Eve, you must understand that by eating that fruit, you will become, <coughs> you will become like God. The first temptation to be like God. But as Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us that we're servants. We're not God. We're God's servant. Helping to meet the needs of the others. We are, if you will, the eyes and the hands, the feet of God. We fail most to serve God and others when we put self first. And maybe the one passage that I have have presented more than any other over the last several years is Luke 9.23, the idea about dying to self, picking up our cross daily and following God. And prayer is a great way to do that. It's a great way to start your day crucifying yourself. That's a little dramatic, but it makes the point. Less of me and more. Of God. That would have been a good song too, Sam. Didn't think of that. Request for our needs and the needs of others. This is one that I, I struggled with too. And, and I talked a good deal about this last week. But this idea, I, I often felt like our prayers sound so whiny. God, I want this, I want this, I need this, I want that, I want this, that. You know, and it's like, are you really... But as I studied it more, it is what God seeks from us. Our supplication, our petitions, our bringing before his throne our needs. And when I stopped thinking about it as uh, 
as a servant of God and started thinking about it as a father of Caleb and Tabitha, I realized that's exactly what God wants. It's exactly what I want. When my kids are in need, I want to hear it. When my kids need something, I want them to tell me. I want them to come to me and say, Dad, I need help. Because what do we love to do as parents? Help our kids, right? Right? Absolutely. I don't want them to suffer, especially if I have the means to make a difference. And our Heavenly Father certainly has the means to make a difference. But that those of us who want to doubt with prayer a little bit, it's like, well, isn't that ridiculous? Why do we have to ask God if He's an all-knowing God? Doesn't He already know what I need? Well, of course He does. But it's not about God. It's about us being willing and open to receive God's help. And prayer is how we communicate that. Of course, God knows it long before we do. But we have to have the right mindset, if you will, the right spirit. We have to be open to the possibility that God can make a difference in our lives. And the way that we communicate that to God is through our prayer. It's humbling to ask for help, isn't it? It's humbling to ask for help. And prayer, again, is that process where we communicate that humility and that willingness to accept the help. We've got to believe that God is the one that can meet our needs. James 5, 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. So here's a little prayer advice. As I always say, we need to think about, okay, what's the application? And so to try to, to help us answer that question, here's a little prayer advice. Pray anyways. Pray anyways. When you don't feel like it, pray anyways. When you don't believe it, pray anyways. Just know it's important enough that we do it. Even when we don't want to, pray anyways. That's a better piece of advice than you might realize. Just think about it. Just think about it. Use examples of prayer from God's Word. If you struggle with how to pray, there are 650 prayers recorded in God's Word. Pick a couple of them. Trust me. Reading through the Psalms, for example, Proverbs, oh my, you need some rich prayers? Spend some time. And let those words be your words okay it's a great way to practice prayer as well use the example of prayers of others don't don't pray alone don't just pray alone i should say how important it, it is to 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 make prayer requests for example seek prayer support again last week i shared a, a prayer request for tabitha my daughter she, who recently lost her job. Oh, thank you to those who honored that prayer request. And some of you reached out to us. You just don't realize how much that means to us. Thank you for honoring that prayer request. She hasn't got a job yet, so keep praying for her. And I imagine there's some prayer requests right here this morning as well. Spoken and unspoken. Honor those requests. Participate in the prayers at worship. Okay? Participate. I know another example of, of prayer words, uh, Kathy does this a lot. She'll use hymns from our hymnal as prayers. She does that a lot. 
Honor the prayer request of others. And I think I've said that enough already. How important it is, though. You know, if it, remember what I said before. People don't ask for help from people they don't believe can meet the need. And so when those prayer requests are brought before us, somebody has put faith in us to lift that need before the throne of God. Make sure we do it. Make sure we do it. Keep it simple. You know, the, I mean, the first thing that Jesus said as he taught his disciples uh, about praying, he says, don't be babbling like this guy and babbling like this guy. And look at that. It's just a few short verses. I mean, I think uh, simple is a good word that describes Jesus' lesson on prayer. Keep it simple. And if that means it's short, the length of your prayer is not how any prayer is judged. I just don't see that anywhere in Scripture. And I think, too, one of the things that we've studied in, in subsequent weeks, is that, or previous weeks, is this idea of, of pray without ceasing. And I don't think that means that we're constantly, 24-7, in prayer. But it's the idea that we never miss prayer. We never miss prayer. Let's say it another way. We're doing it all the time. There aren't chunks of time that go by that I haven't prayed, okay? And I think one of the ways to accomplish that is, is you keep it simple. You know, can you pray while you're going down the highway going to work? Sure you can. Just don't close your eyes. Keep it simple. Again, pray without ceasing. And I think I've addressed that already. What we must, with that, we must realize that the only thing that separates us from the Father's love is our sin. And so that brings us to the invitation today. And I, I realize something, and I, I want to I speak to it. Are you pre or post gospel? Because if you're pre or post gospel, your response this morning uh, would be very differently. Pre-gospel, I'm talking about obedience to the gospel. I'm talking about participating in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ through baptism. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 clearly defines for us the gospel as the death, burial, and resurrection. And Paul in his teaching to the Romans taught us that we partake in that death, burial, and resurrection through our baptism. So if you're here pre-gospel, you haven't been baptized yet, you haven't received the gift of Jesus Christ, that's what I want you to consider this morning as we extend this invitation. But if you're post-gospel, you're a baptized believer. You've accepted that gift, but you realize you're not where you need to be. Then maybe what you need to do this morning is to make a prayer request to repent of whatever sin might be in your way of having the relationship that you and God wants you to have. Please know that we are here to pray for you. We are here to serve you, whether you're needing to obey the gospel or you're just needing to overcome an obstacle in your life. The invitation is for you. And those of you streaming with us, there's my email address. Email me. Email me your prayer request. Email me, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? And if you're, not, if you're here this morning right now, won't you come? Well, together we stand and sing this song of encouragement.